Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, it's a great pleasure. Um, Tony and myself have been running a marathon for the last two and a half years. We, we had a first author meeting about this project in April 2016. And we seem to have been on the go working with uh, our, our respective authors and with the editorial process pretty much ever since. So we're, we're delighted to see this uh, final product of, um, of our labors and we hope that it will make some contribution. We were greatly helped this morning by Joe Stiglitz because he said something which is not often said in development debates. He briefly said that uh, extractive industries, um, natural resources as he called them, including mining, um, should be part of this sort of structural transformation agenda of lower income countries. And he talked about various aspects of that in one slide. So essentially what you're getting this afternoon is Joe Stiglitz's one slide is now transformed into 750 pages of our thoughts over the marathon for the last two and a half years. Um, there was one quote from Joe, I didn't mean to uh, talk about this in the introduction, but I think summarizes some of the aspects that we're trying to get at. I mean, he says uh, in his paper, the development of a country's resources should, to the extent possible, uh, be part of development strategy beyond just the provision of foreign exchange. And I mind that government revenues. Um, Moreover, there can be a variety of linkages to other sectors that can be enhanced. The fact that in the past such linkages appear to be weak may only reflect the lack of effort in developing them. I think that summarizes pretty much some of the uh, in intuition that Tony and myself had when, when we started this project. Um, let's, um, what we're going to do this afternoon, I'm going to briefly um, cover the objectives and content of the book, uh, its main messages, and a, a couple of minutes then on the way we see the scope for policy interventions, both by donor agencies, but of course, most importantly, by national governments. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in, in past years about the importance of governance institutions, but in 750 pages, you can drill down to quite a lot of detail as, as to what exactly that means, and we, we have very much tried to do that. Um, we have 36 authors and, and 33 chapters. So, so in the, the quick overview I'm going to give in topics one, two, and, and three, you, you will understand that we're not going to be able to drill down too much, but we have the benefit of four of our authors on my left, and that they will selectively drill down into some of the subtopics uh, contained within the book. But please understand, it's very much four out of 36. There's a lot more in the book. And although Tony is advertising the discount, I would also pay tribute to Wyatt and OUP for the fact that this is going to be an open access book. So if you don't have the money to pay 100% minus 30%, you can see many of the chapters um, free of access on, on the internet sites. Um, okay, first the objectives of the book. I think the first thing we were trying to do and this is based on a factor of information, is to recognize the increased importance of extractives in the economies of low and low middle income countries. It's amazing to go to meetings like this where one is talking about various aspects of history and recent history and not see extractives mentioned hardly at all in countries like Ghana and Tanzania, where they are actually the most important single private sector industry, they're the most important source of export earnings, they're the most important source of foreign direct investment, and they're commonly the single largest taxpayer. This is a fact that is easily documented but not very widely recognized. Secondly, we wanted to recognize um, more explicitly than has been done in mainstream development debate the, the potential of extractives to boost sustainable development. To do, to do what Joe Stickett's basic was beginning to talk about this morning. To, of course, assess in doing that the impact that climate change is going to have um, on the demand for various minerals and, and, of course, oil and gas, and how that will affect um, some of the host countries in the low and middle income classes that uh, currently mine or produce those items. Then, fourthly, another important element, again, I think it's understated. There has been an absolutely enormous explosion in the last 20 years of international initiatives designed to make extractives more development friendly and more sustainable. I don't think that is widely recognized in the development community. We are not where we were in 1995. We are where we are in 2018. 
with a number of very important and some very effective um, international initiatives. Um, we wanted, fifthly, to try to provide a comprehensive coverage of the multiple domestic policy uh, and institutional areas that need attention if we're go indeed going to turn the potential of extractive industries into genuine long-term sustainable development. There is a lot of talk about institutions matter, governance matters. There's some econometrics where people put governance as the last right-hand variable in the equation. But re this really does not do the job. If you want to talk about institutions and governance, you have to drill down to exactly what that means in a specific context. And we've tried to do that in the book in a lot of detail, and Evelyn will talk about some aspects of that after me. Um, we also wanted pragmatically to try to say a little bit about the difference between countries that are extractives dependent in terms of their potential. It seems to us very unproductive to say that all extractive dependent countries face the same problem. That is clearly not the case. You know, a country like the, the, the DRC is fundamentally different from Brazil. They both have a lot of extractives that can play a, a role. It's important to somehow develop some taxonomies which enable us to frame policies and, and tailor policies to specific circumstances rather than simply talk about a blanket group of, 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 of countries and so on. And stress, um, finally, and this is what Catherine is going to talk about, the imperative in policy terms of having an all-of-government approach. Many of the countries like Mozambique and Tanzania where I've done uh, work, or Kenya, uh, there's a tendency when you talk about extractives to say, well, that's the job of the Ministry of Mines or Minerals. Maybe the Ministry of Finance comes in because of the fiscal management issues. Maybe the central bank comes in for the same reason. But it's really a lot broader than that. And Catherine will say a, a great deal about that uh, in, a, in a few moments. Um, I'm going just to click ahead one slide to pick up the first point, just to um, try to, if I can find it, uh, the data. The, if you're trying to sort of make a statement about the significance of extractive and development, you are able to do it easily for one variable, and that's exports. And that, that's what we've done. You can do it to a limited extent for things like government revenues. It's much more difficult to do it for production. You can do it for foreign direct investment. So this slide is just one slide uh, from one of the chapters of the book that looks at, uh, at exports. Um, but just take a quick look at some of the numbers, comparing 1996 uh, with 2014. This is this, the share of exports of extractive products uh, in, in, in total exports. You'll see the figure from Chad goes from zero to 94%. You'll see the figure for um, um, uh, Ma uh, Mozambique goes from 8% to 62% and so on. Now, in a paper, one of the chapters of the book, Samantha Dodd and myself looked at, identified 72 low and low middle income countries that had more than 25% of their export earnings accounted for by extractives. And in the vast majority of those, over that 20 or so year period, there had been an increase in dependence. Now, a great deal of that is explained by the so-called commodity super cycle, the fact that prices are rising. But we tried to do some, we, we took the analysis from 1996 to 2012, which is about the point where the super cycle was coming to an end, and we moved it along to 2014. It doesn't make much difference. That dependence level has, has, um, has remained high, and it seems likely to remain high. The contents of the book. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in, in um, too much detail. Um, I said we have 33 chapters. We start in part, after the overview from Tony here and myself, we start in part two with a, um, some perspective on the way extractives fit into the global context. We have some, some very data-rich uh, materials, from, particularly from Magnus Ericsson, from the uh, what used to be called the Raw Materials Group in Sweden that looks at the, this for minerals. We have a an in-depth paper by Paul Stevens in Chatham House that does the same for oil, oil and gas. And then in part three, we, we move on to the academic literature. We haven't gone into this in huge detail, but there are three sub-themes. One is the resource curse and what has happened to it. Uh, the second is the way in which institutional economics fits in with the extractives discussion. And the third is the way in which extractive industries fit in with the, the discussions about the new industrial and new structural policies that, again, Joe Stiglitz was talking about this morning. 
And on the last two of those topics, Evelyn will elaborate uh, further later on. Part four is on macroeconomic topics. We have a, a fairly high-powered um, theoretical paper by Tony Venables and Rick van der Plerk from uh, Oxford University looking at the intertemporal problems that countries face in, in handling those macrofiscal problems. And then we have two con contrasting case studies, uh, one written by um, Mahmoudou Bawumia, who um, kindly wrote this chapter, even though uh, towards the end of the process he had become vice president of Ghana, he managed nonetheless to contribute the chapter. Um, so he's written a sort of salutary tale about the management of extractive revenues uh, in the case of Ghana. And then we have the contrasting case written by my colleague Andres Solomano at the end here, um, looking at you know, a somewhat more successful example of a macro and fiscal management of extractives in the case of Chile. And then we go on to the um, institutions of um, national, national institutions of extractive management. And we, we've got a number of contributors here, a number of topic areas. Tony Orbin, as a practitioner in Ghana, talks about it from the point of view of the a practitioner. We have an in-depth chapter on the questions of environmental management of extractives, written by Ruth Green, Greenspan Bell. We have a detailed chapter on the role of um, national oil companies, which play a very important part um, both in the sort of structural decisions about the, the investments that follow on from oil and gas extraction, but also play an important role, in my view, in the macroeconomic management dilemma, because they often control a very significant part of the total revenue streams that flow, flow from, um, especially from oil and gas. Um, we also have a chapter in that uh, section, part um, five, on the gender issues in the sector. And we have uh, an important chapter written by Tony about the international initiatives on climate change and how these will prospectively interact with the extractive dependence of so many low and middle income countries. And then we talk about, uh, in part six, about international initiatives of which there are many. We have, I think, a very important chapter written by Tony Hodge, who, um, uh, when he started to write this, was just retired as the president of the National Council on Mining and Metals, um, which is the organization for which Catherine McPhail also worked for many years. Tony uh, has done an inventory of the international initiatives that have been promulgated mostly in the last uh, 20 years since the turn of the millennium. But he also then asks the question, what are they all done? What are they all achieved collectively? And his answer is quite important because he says, basically, we don't know. Because we don't really have a systematic way of monitoring it. We have impact studies. I've done many myself, together with Evelyn and Catherine. And we have environmental impact assessments Fine, but we don't have what Tony Hodge is arguing for, which is a system, systematic assessment of the contribution of an extractive sector, and he refers mainly to mining, um, to the broad economy in terms of the ecosystem and the economic system, taking the whole product cycle, the life cycle of a project, right through to the most difficult part of a project in mining and, and oil and gas, closure. When, when you've put up a big, big investment in possibly a remote community in a poor country, and it's generated incomes and done some things good and bad for maybe 50 years, and then you have to close it down. So he, he puts this question, it's an unanswered question, but it's a very important, in my view, uh, chapter. And then in part seven, we, we talk about how we leverage what you could call the direct effects of mining and oil and gas in a country, the spending of the corporates in the country, how we can leverage those into bigger transformational effects into other sectors. Uh, there's, a, there's a framework paper written there, but then we have a, a drilling down into topics like local content and upstream uh, effects uh, written in both cases by Oli Ostensen, who used to be the head of commodities uh, in Unktad. And then finally, we, we, we come down, we drill right down to the community level. We've got a number of chapters talking about how you manage extractives at the community level. In a way, the most important Dutch disease and macro gets all the attention, but if you think about it, when you put a mine in Ghana or you put an oil and gas project into Mozambique, you're often putting things in remote areas and you're affecting communities which are actually a small microcosm of the total economy. They get all the negatives, the noise, the disruption, the environmental damage. They tend not to get directly too many of the big number benefits. That tends to go to the national level. So how you manage this and how you help communities and you get corporations to work uh, sympathetically with communities, a very big topic, 
and we've dealt with that in part A. Sorry, that's a bit long-winded. Um, main messages, very quickly. Um, statistically, there are 10 in the book, but we'll concentrate here on eight because time is running short. Statistically, there's little doubt there's been a large increase in dependence. Um, second message is that there doesn't seem to be much controversy that in the future, talking about the next 20, 25 years, that there is a tremendous potential for that level of dependence to increase should the host countries want it to happen. Some host countries may well say, we've read all the stuff about the resource curse, we really don't want any of that. It's hard to find such cases in low-income countries. Most such countries say, my God, we've discovered oil or we've discovered some other valuable mineral, we will develop it, we're going to be rich. But the potential is there, there's some significant documentation of this, not least in the um, uh, very interesting McKinsey study of 2013, which is called Reverse the Curse, where they have estimates of the investment that will be needed uh, in the next 15, 20 years, and argue um, that even if you allow for a climate change adjustment, that level of investment will be significantly higher than it was even in the period 1995 to 2012, which was itself historically very high. So there's, there's tremendous potential to see this statistical dependence on extractives increase in low and middle income countries. If that happens, what's the response? The first response has to be, we need to use this to diversify and achieve structural transformation. Joe Stiglitz was absolutely right that if you're going to do something with natural resources, you cannot do it in a short time frame. You've got to sort of commit it into a long-term development strategy as part of what the economy is doing also in other sectors. You've got to work out the synergies between extractives and agriculture and manufacturing and services. And there are many synergies, many of which we demonstrate in various chapters um, of the book. But the, the diversification agenda has to be absolutely central uh, to the, any strategy in, in these countries, we would argue. Fourth message, improved institutions and governance are important. I mentioned that already, but let's actually, for heaven's sake, say what that means in the context of extractive. Don't just, let's wave our arms and say institutions are important. Um, Fifth message, what would we ideally like to see if we're going to turn the potential into effective development and sustainable development? We would like to see the combination of effective and inclusive governments, whether democratic or less democratic, but effective and inclusive, combined with corporates who are mining the minerals or extracting the oil and gas who are enlightened in some sense. We'd like to see that. The trouble is in many countries, it's not such a, so much a question that we have governments with perhaps limited capacity or with no interest in inclusivity, you know, favoring particular elites or particular ethnic groups, but we also see that sometimes combined with companies that really do not pay attention to any sort of social obligation to help with a development strategy. But then the sixth message is looking at all the evidence, and we have plenty of evidence for this, corporate practices have improved out of sight in the last 15 or 20 years. Many more companies have been abundance, uh, have, have been enlightened, and there's abundance of very good case examples to demonstrate this. They've been helped by things like the IFC principles and also the ICM, ICCM sustainability principles, which um, are now adhered to, I think, Catherine, correct me if I'm wrong, by about 33 companies which together in mining represent about 60% of world production. So there, there is a real sense in which the corporate sector is now a, an enlightened participant in the development debate and not the pariah organization, set of organizations that perhaps it was once presented as being. Seventh, there are now a lot more ways in which governments of host countries can get help from international initiatives like the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, like the National Resource Charter, like the African Mining Vision, and like the other 42 similar examples that Tony Hodge identifies in his chapter. Governments should take advantage of those. The final message is climate change will change the story, will change the perspective, the outcome, and the outlook for some countries. There will be winners and losers as we move away towards a less carbon-dependent future, 
We know that coal will go, but how fast will it go in those low-income countries that currently have a significant coal resource? Probably not that f as fast as perhaps some people would like it to happen. But we know setting against that will be the, the minerals which will be absolutely critical to the new um, environmentally friendly, climate friendly technologies of the future. We know for sure that if you were an investor in 2007, you would have done no better than put your money into cobalt and lithium. Because notwithstanding the end of the super cycle of commodity prices, cobalt and lithium rose faster than almost any other asset you could have invested in at that time. We have the rare earths, which are critical ingredients in wind turbines. Until quite recently, they were concentrated in China. There was some anxiety about that fact, but you know, we know for sure that they're now being opened up to the country. So climate change will, will affect this agenda quite significantly. But we think positively. We do not think it will unroad the, um, the basic proposition I put um, in message two, that there will be a huge potential for an increase in the dependence of low and middle income countries on extractive resources should they wish to accept that dependence. And this, of course, is a, a, a choice for national governments. It's not a prediction. And I'm going to finish then with the, um, this slide, which Tony and myself agonized over when we were drinking beer one day in London. But we think it might be quite helpful. I mean, in dichotomizing governments and the quality of governments, we, um, we are used to sort of talking about time horizons uh, Ernest Arate used, yesterday usefully talked about the, the difficulties in his country, Ghana, of governments that work with a, a four-year time horizon. It's a particularly serious problem in, in extractive industries because the life time horizon of a mining company is typically 20 or 30 years. Uh, I've done work in Brazil on, on iron ore in the, in the Amazon region where the, the life expectancy of the mines, the time horizon for planning is 100 years. So we're used to that uh, dichotomy, time horizon. We're used to the di dichotomy, um, democratic versus non-democratic. We had some discussion of that in, in, in some of the sessions yesterday. But what we thought would be useful would be to look at this in terms of in, for governments. Are they technically effective? You know, do they have the technical capacities? And are they inclusive? There are two dimensions of this. And at the top of this, we've got the ones that the governments that are complying with that uh, uh, ideal state. At the bottom, we have the opposite sort of governments. They couldn't care a damn for their citizens. They are, they're not inclusive. They're favoring certain elites or certain narrow groups. And then in the, in the other dimension of this diagram, we've got companies. Here we have enlightened companies. Those that would perhaps have subscribed completely fully to the IFC principles of sustainability or to the ICCM principles, which are quite similar, or indeed to the Communist China principles in mining, which are now adopt, adapted, and uh, sorry, adopted, and are very similar in some respects to what the ICCM came up with 15 years ago. At the other end, we have what you might call rogue companies who go in to dig out the, the gold mine or the copper and do this abusing labor rights, human rights, and every other right you can think of. And we have this spectrum, therefore, in these four zones. And what we're basically saying, this is quite useful to think about zone B, because if you have a prior that a country is, is somewhere in zone B. Now, the, com the government's broadly effective and, and uh, fairly inclusive. You know, countries like Ghana and Tanzania come immediately to mind. And they find they've got companies turning up in their country that are pretty enlightened. They understand their international and domestic obligation. There's a very good chance of getting progress if the, if the domestic policies are, are put together in such a way as to take that long-term view and to think about the linkages that Joe Stiglitz talks about and develop those and have policies specifically to develop them. If we're down here, it's the opposite story. Um, you know, how are we going to get the EITI working in a, in, with the warlord governments and with rogue companies? They'll try, they'll make some impression, but it won't be necessarily um, all that effective. So I, I'm going to stop at this point by just mentioning one more chapter in the book, which is down here, we could be perhaps a bit depressed. You know, we've got relatively poor quality governments. We may have some pretty lousy companies. But we would expect, I think, that the cumulative effect of these international initiatives I mentioned uh, earlier would have some, even there, would have some marginal effect. We have one very interesting chapter in the book about what you do in a country like Nigeria. 
I'm not necessarily putting Nigeria in any of those boxes. Um, recognizing the, the inherent difficulties, the inherent corruption that some people uh, identify there. And uh, the, it represents what I think is one of the more important donor projects in Syria. It's, it's fin funded by DFID. It's the Foster Project. And it has been perceived to be an extremely successful example of where a donor intervention can make a difference. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass over the microphone.